Welcome to Utopian Horizons. Hello and welcome to episode 20 of Utopian Horizons, a podcast where I look at a different utopia, dystopia, utopian thinker or movement in each episode. I do this in order to explore different visions of the future, to talk about what these utopians and dystopias might tell us about our contemporary context, and to think about the value of utopia as a political tool, uh, as a critical tool. So thinking about the value utopia can give us uh, as, a, as a method of thinking, as a approach with a methodology is just as much as thinking about the specificities of specific utopias and dystopias. As this is the 20th episode and there's a good chance that people may have only started listening to the podcast recently. This has included me looking at lots of science fiction I've been doing. I've done a few episodes on Philip K. Dick novels myself. I'm actually working my way through the whole of Philip K. Dick's bibliography. That's the plan anyway. Um, the next episode, coincidentally, will be on The Simulacra, which is what I'm reading at the moment. But I've done The Man in the High Castle, Tom Out of Joint, uh, Martian Time Slip. So that's there if you want to check that out. I've also done stuff like Neuromancer, Strange Days, Robocop. So lots of science fiction there. I've done more. I've done a few on like real utopian movements or thinkers. So I've done one on Louise Michel, who is a member of the Paris Commune. I've done one on Corbyn and Corbynism. I've done the Black Panthers. I've done an episode that is just an introduction to Utopia, which is the very first episode. So if you're kind of not familiar with the, the concept and some of the thinking around it, then that's a good one to go back to. Um, I've also done one on A Modern Utopia um, by H.G. Wells. This episode is on a novel from that kind of era. It's called The Angel of the Revolution. It's not a novel I had heard of, but um, as you'll hear when we get to talk to my guest, it's a novel that people at the time would certainly have been aware of. I won't give you too much of a synopsis because that'll be repeating ground that, that comes up with the interview, but essentially it's a book about a underground socialist slash anarchist organisation um, planning a coup, like a world revolution, um, using this air technology they've discovered to give them dominion over the skies. Joining me to talk about the book is Dr. Duncan Bell from the University of Cambridge. He teaches and writes about Utopia, among other things. And he's, as you'll hear, he's, he's working on a book that touches on a lot of the ideas um, that come up in this novel. So a lot of that stuff's around the idea of racial Utopia and Utopias being constructed around this idea of, of like a pure race or superior race. Um, I suppose in a sense, like picking out some of the problematic uten- tendencies in Utopian thought that uh, that may not have been talked about too much. So um, before we get on to that conversation, I just wanted to say... If you've been enjoying this podcast, it would be really helpful if you could recommend it to someone that you think might like it. Um, give me a review on iTunes, that would be good. I still don't have many of those, despite me annoyingly for you mentioning it uh, pretty much every episode. Tweeting about it would be good. I mean, I'll prefer the review. I prefer you recommend it to someone, but you know, I'll take a tweet. If you feel like you are able to and would like to support this podcast financially so I can keep doing it and hopefully get some episodes out more quickly, I do try and get these out as quick as I can, but it's difficult to uh, kind of produce them at any kind of fast pace, which I'd like to do and would hopefully could do if I had more more money. But yeah, uh, I do the best I can right now. So if you would like to support me doing this and, and as I say, give me a chance to get get some out more regularly, then I've got a Patreon at patreon.com slash utopian horizons where you can uh, throw a little bit of cash my way to, to help me with doing the podcast. I won't talk any more about the book we're covering but, and what it's about and the themes because we do all that in the in the interview and you don't want to hear me talk about it twice. So so now I would just hand you over to past me talking with Duncan. Joining me now is Duncan Bell from the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Cambridge. Thank you very much for joining me, Duncan. Thank you very much for inviting me on. So Duncan has come on to talk to me today about an, a novel called The Angel of the Revolution, written by George Griffiths and published in 1893. Um, could you just, uh, I think you, you mentioned to me before that this novel would have been 
So I, I hadn't have heard, heard of this before. Um, obviously, I've, having covered stuff like H.G. Wells and stuff, most people have heard of H.G. Wells. George Griffiths isn't someone I've heard of before, but you mentioned to me that this guy, this would have been very well known at the time. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So Griffith, uh, for a brief period in the early 1890s, was the best known science fiction writer uh, in Britain. He was eclipsed by H.G. Wells, really, in the in the mid to late 1890s. But this uh, particular novel, uh, The Angel of the Revolution, was a bestseller. Uh, in fact, it's arguably the bestselling um, of the so-called invasion uh, novels of the period, which were incredibly popular as a subgenre. So he was a yeah, a very famous popular writer at the time. Uh, today, most people haven't uh, heard of him. Okay. Um, so I will try to give a brief uh, plot synopsis so people know what we're talking about before we get into the details. So this is a book about a man called Richard Arnold who devotes himself to the discovery of flight and kind of slides into abject poverty as he devotes everything to this um, to this goal. He succeeds in uh, discovering um, flight, He but he has no money to do anything. He's contemplating suicide. Then he ends up meeting a guy called Morris Colston, who persuades him to join um, the terrorists, is what most people refer to them as, which is a, a global union of anarchists and socialists operating as a, a secret society. And he he kind of makes a declaration that he would only ever use this technology he's created to against rulers and the, the despots that, that cause war. The terrorists desire to say that they want to wipe out tyranny and that so that kind of chimes with their beliefs so they they come together and the and the, the story is basically about how the terrorists uh, plan using this technology that he's created plan a, and implement a revolution based on the aerial domination that these flying ships give them to to create a new world so hopefully that'll give people a rough idea of what we're talking about so um obviously a big part of this book is a, about the desire to end war which is obviously a, an admirable utopian goal um i didn't realize there was quite um such a big sort of intellectual history to this and what a big subject of a debate this was at the time so c- could you um tell us a little bit about that intellectual history and like situate this book in in that context of what people were talking about yeah so this book is both representative and unrepresentative in interesting ways. So it's representative of a quite broad discourse uh, concerned with what I call racial utopianism, where the kind of standard line is that the Anglo-Saxon race or the English-speaking peoples reunite or unite together and bring peace to the earth. Mm. And so there are dozens of novels at the time that uh, argue along these lines, and that's part of a wider set of arguments at the time making the case for reunifying particularly Britain and the United States, but also um, Britain and its settler colonies in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and so forth. So this is uh, a subject on which I'm writing a book, and I tie this into the much broader burst of utopian writing that happens in the late 19th century. But whereas most of that is uh, um, focused on kind of projecting a socialist vision of the future, the standard racial utopian line uh, is relatively quiet about the internal structures of the Anglo-Saxon peoples, but focuses instead on how reuniting them in some way, usually after a war, can help to bring peace to the earth. And so I see racism and the kind of white supremacism of the period as an important part of the utopianism of the era. So in that sense, the Angel of the Revolution is quite representative. Where it's unrepresentative is its socialism. So most of the novels at least uh, that I have looked at, again largely forgotten today, say little um, about, as I say, the political economy of uh, of this new institution that would arise following the reunification. But this Mm. is very much pitched as a socialist vision. And so you get an odd fusion of a socialist reworking of Britain and the United States based on broadly Henry George-like ideas about land nationalisation and this white supremacist vision of Anglo-Saxonism. And so Griffith's book is really the only one that does that. And that's why I picked it uh, to talk about today, because its utopian content is both in the kind of racial vision of perpetual peace, but also ties into, um, I guess, more common utopian concerns at the time to do with uh, the critique of capitalism and the um, attempt to bring about a socialist future. Mm. And it, this book obviously kind of outlines like an apocalyptic route to get to um 
it's utopia which is yeah it's, it's interesting that's a, a trend that you you get sometimes in obviously in utopian fiction this idea that you have to kind of level things out like destroy things completely you know obviously you get a lot of like post-disaster um utopias and things like this which this very much is and th- and this is novel obviously notable for predicting the coming of the the first world war in some respect as well because this utopia can only be created like after this um terrible conflict that happened he, he kind of gets the, the the country's wrong but even to the point of um of uh, noting that you know the various treaties that countries would be locked in was going to inevitably lead to this this like massive conflict which is interesting yeah, it's quite prescient in various ways. Um, perhaps above all, the role that air power plays in it. Again, he's not the first to, to stress this. There is a, a kind of group of novels, and H.G. Wells goes on to write one a bit later, which um, talk about what we might call a Pax Aeronautica, which is the kind of vision of peace brought about through superiority and air power. Mm. And so that's interesting. But the, before the First World War, um, for about 30 or 40 years before the First World War, in fact, arguably the best-selling popular genre of literature um, in both Britain and the United States was what's come to be called the invasion literature. And this was endless novels and short stories imagining a future war. And the kind of particular players changed, the configurations and the alliances changed. But it was usually something along the lines of what you get in uh, in this novel, where you have Britain um, allied with um, a couple of other countries and against the Triple Alliance and Russia. So I think you end up with it's Germany and Britain mm. uh, fighting a war against France and Italy and Russia. And the configuration changes in other novels. Sometimes it's Britain fighting alongside Germany. Sometimes it's fighting with Germany. Intriguingly, quite a few of these novels have Britain and the United States fighting against each other first right. and then finally kind of reconciling and joining together to go on to police and order the world in various ways. So it's a profoundly violent uh, genre, frankly. Mm. This is one of the more violent novels in it. The casualty count is in the tens of millions by the end of the novel. Um, But some others imagine essentially a global genocide Mm. as a precursor to a future um, peaceful order. There was a separate grouping which um, imagined that peace could be brought about via broadly peaceful means. Uh, but that falls outside the invasion literature subgenre. Mm. I, think, I think it perhaps says something about the kind of difficulty of uh, not just imagining utopia, but of imagining like a route to utopia, which obviously we have now like difficulties, um, you know, the difficulty of imagining like the end of capitalism, for example, and what that might look like. Uh, this sort of, yeah, this need to just like wipe things out, destroy everything to get to the next bit is kind of instructive of how difficult it is to um, imagine a path to utopia, I think. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that, that becomes what one of the major criticisms of utopia in the second half of the 20th century. So particularly mid 20th century critics like uh, Karl Popper thought that one of the major problems, one of the major dangers with utopianism was that it required a return to a kind of ground zero or blank slate to then rebuild in the image of whatever the utopian dream is. And that that was necessarily violent and coercive. What you find in the late 19th century amongst utopians is often an evasion of this issue especially in the novels where you just wake up 100 years in the future and the society has changed and you describe the society and say very little about the transition story that gets you there. What this genre does, and this genre, I should add, is not normally included as part of the utopian tradition. It's something that I'm uh, arguing in my own work, but I think it's clearest in The Angel of the Revolution. You get the transition story being played out and it's almost invariably violent. Mm. And I say H.G. Wells himself um, imagine something like this happening. Uh, He doesn't think that a world state can be brought about via peaceful means. He thinks that it will invariably result in significant opposition from those committed to nationalism and to various forms of um, xenophobia and bigotry. And so you will inevitably have violence on the road to perpetual peace. Mm. So... I de- I've wanted to obviously talk about this ra- um, racial aspect as a massive part of the book, but before I get to that, I just want to you know, talk a little bit about the the socialist um, aspect of of this vision. So this um, the, this socialist group, it's in contradiction to some of the stuff we might discuss later. It's a kind of international crew. We've got like Russians, English, German. Um, French people in, involved uh, in this secret society. They say that these people have no country but the world. 
Um, there are uh, women involved in the inner circle of, of power. So though this book definitely doesn't have an egalitarian portrayal of women, I would say. Um, I agree, yeah. <laughs> but it, it does at least have women who are, you know, they are part of the power structure. They are in the central circle. They say they've, they've got no private property. Everything they have is is the, is for the you know the brotherhoods and there are so there's not a lot of like specific stuff but like towards the end they say that they end like uh, land ownership people aren't allowed to get rent from land there's a bit on tax at the end so any income over a certain amount is is taxed heavily but um, what I found quite interesting that this this uh, kind of very socialist vision is quite interesting that the the class composition of the people we actually see in the in the novel like the people the actual characters there's no working class people there at all um i want is that kind of representative of a kind of paternalism that existed within like socialist thought at the time socialist thought at the time was extremely varied and so mm. i wouldn't say it was representative um okay. there are socialist current socialist movements which are very much based in and oriented towards the working class but there's also a fairly large middle class socialist uh, movement and so it really differed i mean i think you're right about this novel there's very little uh, agency given really to or at least very little voice given to the working classes yeah. the working classes do rise at the end of the novel they form the um, bulk of yeah. the so-called red international the military forces of the Red International, which overthrow the capitalist class and the ruling monarchs and, and presidents and so on. And so they're, they're given a substantial role, but you never really hear them speak. They're almost as if they're a kind of um, automatic body who are ready to be um, turned on by this small group of uh, elite political actors when the, when the time comes. So, it, you know, it's not a great novel, it should be said for a start, but also the particular portrayal um, of class politics is not not exactly sophisticated and so it's in that sense not especially unusual i mean there is very much a view that this is uh, a revolution which has been designed by a small vanguardist elite uh, and in fact the british figure who is given the um, role of leading the anglo-saxon peoples to save the world and to who becomes the first president of what they call the federation of the english-speaking peoples of the world alan tremaine is a member of the house of lords and it looks like he stepped out of a punch cartoon. He's there wearing his kind of hunting gear. <laughs> and he ends up voicing this kind of revolutionary uh, vision where land is nationalized, where the monarchy is overthrown, where the plutocrats have taken over the United States, are exiled to Siberia. Uh, and it's just a, a kind of extraordinary mishmash of, of visions. And so, yeah, it's it's not especially sophisticated. I mean, there are far more sophisticated uh, socialist thinkers around for sure. Uh, but you can pick out some quite interesting references to existing socialist thought at the time. As I say, I think Henry George uh, and his vision of land nationalisation plays a significant role uh, in the um, quite thinly sketched positive vision of what socialism will look like towards the end of the novel. Henry George, of course, was a, a kind of world famous political economist and um, socialist writer at the time. But more attention is paid in a novel to the critique of the existing order than to the alternative. Mm. And so there is a pretty fierce um, and unrelenting attack on plutocracy. The United States in particular is um, imagined as a society in which the government has essentially been bought out and is in the pocket of the capitalist class. Mm. And it's partly for that reason that this novel was never actually printed in the United States. Griffith had a big reputation in Britain, but it didn't really travel to the US because he was seen as a too anti-American. Oh, okay. And likewise, as a Brit, um, it's relatively unusual at the time to be calling for the overthrow of the monarchy and the existing institutions. Uh, and so it's quite radical in that sense. Mm. But it is nevertheless a paternalistic uh, vision of certainly transition. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, even, even with those sort of obvious like, problems though like you know this idea that the class of exploitation are, are the ones that are going to save the exploited and, and all and all this stuff and as i say the, the, he's arnold says all the inner circle evidently belong to the educated or rather to the culture class so yeah i mean it's quite obvious there there it's not like subtle um it would yep. have been it's not insignificant perhaps that these these like socialist ideas, which I presume would have been seen as quite radical at the time, were in like a best-selling novel. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, it is. It is interesting. I mean, this was a period in which uh, utopian novels were incredibly popular, and so um, probably above all, Edward Bellamy's uh, Looking Backwards and um, William Morris's News from Nowhere were were bestsellers on both sides of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. 
there was an audience for this. What Griffith did very cleverly was to combine, in a way, two different genres. Uh, and so one of them was this invasion literature, which was, um, in most instances, very conservative. You had this racial utopian dimension, which brings about perpetual peace, but there's no great um, critique or no critique really at all of the um, existing, say, political economy or class societies uh, of the time. And so it's actually uh, a kind of xenophobic, militaristic conservative genre in in most cases and to combine that with this popular socialist utopian genre which is talking about the transformation of um, the capitalist order in all kinds of ways but doesn't tend to say much about international politics and war and so what he manages to do is fuse these two together and in a way he's then got a ready-made large audience because these types of books different as they were were um, selling huge amounts at the time Okay. Um, yeah, just one final thing I, I wanted to mention on that sort of socialist aspect. I thought it was interesting that he kind of lays out this idea of, you know, they've got no personal property and everything's equal and so on and so forth. And at the end of the novel, we have like the uh, the main character honeymooning in like a big country house. So it, like, it hasn't been really... So it, yeah, it, absolutely. It seems like... For these people at the top, it doesn't seem like that type of stuff that actually changed. But um, anyway, let's let's go on to talk about the the race stuff because that's really important and really central to this this vision that Griffiths has. So, like the longer the the novel goes on, like these like socialist ideals, this hatred of tyranny and royalty, and you know talking about torture and domination, exploitation stuff, it feels like that fades as the novel goes on and race becomes more and more central and uh, as you said this idea of the anglo-saxon race being like the uh, leaders of the world um so this was a a, a vision that i'm right in saying wasn't just we, we've obviously talked about it being um uh, present in fiction at the time but this is something that people were like t- talking about right like yeah you've um i was read your essay and you were talking Absolutely. about people like um carnegie and so on yeah no that's right so I read this form of utopianism as a discourse that moved between and beyond fiction in all kinds of interesting ways. Uh, And it was quite common to hear versions of it amongst um, leading politicians, journalists, political thinkers, and so on. My own book on the subject focuses on four in particular, H.G. Wells, but in his non-fictional writings, um, Andrew Carnegie, one of the two or three richest people on earth, uh, the US uh, British steel magnate, Cecil Rhodes, the most infamous imperialist of the day, and of course in the news quite a lot recently, um, and a man who's much less well known called W.T. Stead, who was one of the best known uh, journalists at the time. So you get there people in very different professions, all of whom are arguing for versions of this kind of racial utopia, believing that if you could reunite particularly Britain and the United States, but then also often um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you could transform the world uh, in all kinds of ways. And so it was in the 18, late 1880s and particularly in the 1890s, uh, and then for a few years, nearly 20th century, a pretty widespread um, discourse in Britain. And you found aspects of it too in the United States, in Canada and in Australia. It's part of the more general um, kind of pervasive racism of the period. But what's interesting to me uh, is how this racism is tied into a form of utopianism in a way that um, might be quite counterintuitive. These are people whose racism was um, basically tied up with a vision of world transformation that resulted in a kind of um, vision of global peace and, and justice. It's a very peculiar combination of ideas from a, you know, our own perspective today, but it was quite common at the time. Mm. I just uh, I just still got to give people an idea who, who may have read the novel as well, just a couple of quotes, the, the, the type of things, you know, how, how pronounced this is. So in the novel, he talks about Europe being distracted by war, and he says, Eastern swarms will sweep, innumerable as the locust, resistless as the pestilence. Nothing should be left of all the glory of Christendom. Um, he talks about being there one power that can stand between the Western world and its destruction, and that is the race to which you belong it's the conquering race of earth and the choices fruit of all the ages until now and yeah so on and so forth so um it's re- it's really pronouncing it he explicitly talks all the time about you know anglo-saxons as an anglo-saxon planet absolutely they talk about it being called an anglo-saxon federation between um 
between the US and um, Europe, making Anglo-Saxon race the dominant power and so on. Um, something that I quite, found quite interesting in, in, your, in your essay I read about this was you mentioned like the slipperiness of this term Anglo-Saxon. Like It's really useful for, um, for these kind of utopian races because you can kind of, it can kind of mean what you want it to mean. Up to a point. I mean, I, point, I argue sure. that it was kind of figured at the time as what I call a biocultural assemblage, which is to say that it's a fusion of claims about biology and culture. Mm. And so what you find is a kind of hard physiological shell of whiteness. Mm -hmm. But within that, there is quite a lot of malleability. So crudely put, um, Eastern Europeans who are mig and Irish who are migrating from Europe to the United States can become Anglo-Saxon. Mm. if they adopt certain behavioral patterns and beliefs. But African-Americans and, um, in, you know, subject to the British Empire from South Asia cannot do so because they cannot um, move across the, the barrier of whiteness. Mm. And so it's fixed in one sense, but it's quite fluid in another sense. And that's uh, a kind of melting pot vision of, of race at the time in the United States. And so it's not... In other words, strictly about biological lineage, whatever that might mean. Mm. It is a lot about shared beliefs, shared language, shared memories, but only those that are shared amongst people who can come to be seen as white, mm. which is why this is a white supremacist vision um, of politics. I mean, the underlying conceptual point here is that it's race rather than political institutions, um, rather than the nation, rather than the state, that is the basic unit of politics for a lot of these people. And so the United States, in a kind of waspish vision, and Britain and Australia are all part of the same political community. And the fact that they're governed by different um, governments, the fact that they're technically sovereign uh, polities, the United States and Britain, is of secondary significance. The most important thing is that they belong to the same race the so-called Anglo-Saxon and sometimes called English-speaking race. And the people that I'm looking at want to basically have that recognised by the political institutions, by reunifying them in some sense, whether it's merging to create a new you know, supra-parliament or whether it's creating a kind of joint citizenship. Uh, they don't think that they should be separate political communities because ultimately race is the most important marker of identity. It's interesting. So I think that, that kind of Anglo-Saxon term is uh, is used now as well by like some you know alt-right or various right-wing um groups as if they don't want to talk openly about the white supremacy you can say that you just care about your european heritage or your anglo-saxon um, traditions which Absolutely. is kind of a, i yeah. mean it's quite obvious what that really means but it's kind of a coded way of of like using it um, something that is interesting as well, you, you pointed out that this this idea, this Anglo-Saxon thing, this could be adopted by people across the political spectrum. So yes. obviously we would tend to think of this kind of racist vision as being, um, you know, a very authoritarian or like conservative thing. But you, you've pointed out that this is something that was malleable to different, to ostensibly different political beliefs, like radical, liberal and so on. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there were some socialists who bought into this kind of vision, uh, including deep into the 20th century. Uh, there were lots of liberals. So um, in their own ways, Carnegie, Rhodes, Wells and um, Stead are all liberal uh, or liberal socialist in Wells's case. And of course, there are many conservatives who could buy into it too. But it doesn't map directly onto political affiliation because there were socialists, there were liberals, and there were conservatives who also were deeply sceptical about these claims about Anglo-Saxonism. Mm. So it crossed the different um, party political divides, as it were, but it didn't uh, exhaust the um, spectrum either. There were plenty of critics of this kind of view. And Wells himself plays a, a rather anomalous role in it. He was extremely critical of the idea of Anglo-Saxonism because he was extremely critical of the idea of race tied in some way to biology. He thought it was a terrible misunderstanding of evolutionary science. Instead, he talked about the English-speaking peoples, uh, and the way he talked about them was very similar to the way in which the Anglo-Saxonists talked about Anglo-Saxondom, but he insisted that his vision had a different um, theoretical foundation. He still thought that Britain and the United States should reunify and that that would eventually help to bring about a world state and peace, uh, but he was one of the people, although rare at the time, who um, fundamentally rejected uh, the, the race science. He called it race mania uh, of the time. Mm. So um, 
just going back to the the kind of slipperiness of, of the term a bit. So in this novel, the primary kind of enemy in this book is is Russia. They're the most powerful enemy allied with France and Italy. For most of the novel, the terrorists kind of sit out the war as they're kind of just letting destruction roll on so they can kind of sweep in at the end. So Britain's like on the edge of defeat when they decide to, to come in and defeat the Russians. But then what they do is they they kind of they divide the world with um they say with the, the term they use with the Muslim leader. So there's like the white Anglo-Saxon world is one kind of part of it and they kind of leave the rest, as it were, to the the Muslims as a way that um the novel um thinks of it. But um the the Russians as I said are predicted as being um the primary antagonist they don't seem to be thought of as anglo-saxon yet there are russians in the terrorists who are treated as equals and who are part of the inner circle so uh it seems that there's something uh yeah i can't quite work out like where the where the so that that shows something about the mobility of whiteness here so the, the russians as a whole would be treated in the novel as slavs Right, but Slavs are capable of becoming Anglo-Saxon if they uh, adopt certain behavioural patterns. You know, if they migrate to the United States and essentially become wasps, mm. then their um, racial um, identity is taken to change, and that's thought to be perfectly possible. Uh, and this is not something that just happens in a novel. This is common at the time. There's a very famous book uh, by a social historian called uh, When the Irish Became White. And it's a similar sort of dynamic that happens with lots of Eastern Europeans too. That's the kind of mobility that is unavailable, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to, um, say, African-Americans or to um, Indians. It's just not possible. So that's the kind of weird combination of fixity and mobility uh, or fluidity that you find in this conception of race. Now, the Russians play the bad guys in this novel like they do in quite a few others at the time but the the enemy does tend to shift over time the invasion literature itself starts off really in the 1870s um, with a very famous um, popular uh, very short book uh, called the battle of dorking which imagines a future german invasion uh, of britain and as i say various enemies are posited by the authors who write these things um, and The authors are often journalists or military officers. Chesney himself was a quite senior British military officer. But as you move into the early 20th century, it's increasingly becoming the Germans. Mm. And it's therefore kind of tracking general geopolitical fears uh, that are permeating um, public discourse at the time. And that's because the genre in general uh, is a very, very didactic one. It's intended with a particular political purpose. The aim is to try to um, mobilize military spending uh, or to kind of warn the political elite or the populace as a whole about the coming dangers. And so it's no surprise then that quite a lot of military officers and others uh, are involved in writing it. And that's again why this particular novel stands out a bit, because its own politics are very different from um, the kind that, should we say, the uh, leadership of the British military are going to be particularly interested in. as As you mentioned earlier, it's not as revolutionary as it might first appear, because private property isn't abolished. But it is nevertheless a very significant transformation insofar as it's arguing for land nationalisation, progressive taxation, um, a downplaying of the role of the state, a critique of nationalism, the emergence of a kind of internationalist federation, which will help to police the world through air power. Again, this is very much a kind of top-down vision of how peace is enforced by this kind of radical new technology, which the Anglo-Saxons will have control of, both as a reflection of their own genius for science and order, and as a mechanism for helping to police and patrol the world. Mm. What about what about the representation of, of Jewish people in this book? Because the so the leader of the terrorists is a guy called Natas, who is Jewish, and he is a genius, like almost has like implied mystical abilities, and like he's a brilliant strategist. Um, he, his decisions are like flawless. He's this great man. But when the when once the terrorists have won, he hands over the power to the Anglo Saxons because he says they deserve the earth. So, um, and also there seem to be a lot of the the, the kind of secret society of capitalists in America it had some kind of classic like anti Semitic parallels in there, I suppose. And obviously the the you know this whole secret society terrorist thing plays into kind of anti-semitic conspiracy th- theories so yeah just again that was another strange yep yeah i, I mean i think there's an element of that there although i would say that the 
the fact that Natas is one of the heroes of the novel makes this not not as bad as many other novels of yeah, the period, sure. which are fairly straightforwardly anti-Semitic. Um, so yes, I think there is a problematic representation there, just as a problematic representation of women. Um, this is not, I would suggest, a particularly progressive book. Uh, I mean, it has the socialist kind of political economy in there, but it is militaristic, um, it's xenophobic, it's uh, misogynist in various ways. Mm. So yes, absolutely. I'm certainly not suggesting that we should look to this as a, a positive utopian vision. Right. Um, my kind of thought is that we need to expand the category of what counts as utopian text at the time to recognize the kind of uh, arguments that were being made about bringing the socialist revolution, bringing peace to the earth, um, the role of empire and race within these, which was absolutely central um, and shouldn't be surprising given this was a period in which um, racism and white supremacism were absolutely pervasive um, in the North Atlantic world uh, and elsewhere. So yeah, all of that's in there. The point about terrorism though, I mean, so there's a f great fear of terrorism more broadly in the late 19th century. Um, secret societies are thought to be everything of Joseph Conrad um, writing about this too. Griffith is picking up a theme that's popular at the time rather than inventing one there. Um, there's a large amount of writing that talks about these. The interesting thing about this novel is that it recodes it. The terrorists are the good guys yeah. here. So the terrorists are the nickname for a group whose proper name is the um, the Brotherhood of Freedom mm. and that they are the overarching body which coordinates these apparently disparate anarchist cells um, these freedom fighters in various despotic regimes. And, you know, as it turns out, they're actually all coordinated by the same guy, this little group around Natas. But they are presented as the, the heroes of the book. They're the midwives of Anglo-Saxon perpetual peace. Natas does step aside, but he's key throughout the whole thing. There's a very weird subtext in it, which is about the way in which he has hypnotized Tremaine. Mm. Um, and it's a kind of function of the novel. This, when this was originally serialized in the, um, the Pearson's magazine in the late 1890s, there was a 5,000 word chapter in there about how Natas had gained control through hypnotism over Tremaine. And that's dropped from the novel. So this plot line appears it's at some kind point of implied, and it? is really frankly baffling. Uh, and I had no idea what was going on until I found out this other thing that there's actually a backstory to this. Uh, presumably, the point there is that a good, upstanding, solid Englishman would never have agreed to have um, acted against his own government without being under some kind of psychological control. Yeah, I think, um, I think he... But yeah, it's, so there's lots of peculiar things going on in here. But one of the, say, more interesting and unusual things is the way in which the terrorists and the anarchists and so on are actually presented as the heroes of the story rather than, as is usually the case, uh, an enemy to be destroyed. Mm. Yeah, I think on that, it, it, I think there's actually a line in there where it, it says that Tremaine acted against the tr traditions of his race and station. Um, as you said, that that hypnotism thing is kind of there in an implied way. Like even yeah, I didn't know about this thing being cut out. But yeah, so I think this is. I, I get the feeling that this guy is sort of unable to overcome like his patriotism. Like he's clearly um, again, it, it, this novel's got a lot of stuff that is. Uh, appears to be quite radical in terms of how he how he like hates like authority and exploitation and so on. But the way he talks about Britain again, that comes more and more into it. Britain's the motherland of Anglo-Saxon nations, and yep. um, he talks about how the Anglo-Saxon races rallied to the defence of its motherland, and it is in the, in the victory speech. And it's like, hang on, when was that? I thought this was about a you know revolution to create a new world, and now it's suddenly about defending. Yeah. The it's a very bizarre switch. Yeah. It's it's about halfway through the novel where you think it's going in one direction, and suddenly it seems to be going in a very different direction. And uh, yeah, it's one of the reasons why it's not a very good novel as a whole. It's what it's one of the reasons why it's interesting politically, um, but as a piece of uh, fictional writing it does make it uh, rather uh, problematic yeah. to say the least the Sorry. kind of intriguing thing in terms of the way in which the anglo-saxons are presented in this novel though which is quite unusual at the time is that they're separated from their institutions so in most of the texts which celebrate and valorize the anglo-saxons one of the things that makes them great is their parliamentary system their liberal capitalist order the monarchy um, and so on and so forth, fairly you know, predictable group of institutions. But in this novel, that isn't what makes them great. And in fact, they're then dismantled at the end. The monarchy is abolished. Capitalism is radically reformed. It's an underlying kind of racial essence, which seems to be about the intrinsic value of freedom 
and the kind of superior capacity and ability for genius, which is doing the work in the argument. And that is unusual. So it's the combination of the kind of dismissal of many of the institutions which are normally taken to be markers of the greatness of uh, the Anglo-Saxons with this kind of claim that nevertheless, they're still the greatest. It's just that they will bring about world peace through a kind of socialist set of um, institutions and order. Okay, just um, one, one final question. Um, with um, So technology is obviously very important in this book, like the the idea that they've created a new technology that completely changes um, how war is, is, is fought. That's very key to it. Um, did, does this kind of veneration of technology as, as like the path to a new world, was that, did that tend to be tied up in these ideas we've already talked about that people were talking about, you know, the end of war and, uh, it, Anglo, new Anglo-Saxon utopia was technology a key part of that for most of those people as well? Absolutely, uh, particularly in the fictional narratives. So, and again, actually, particularly in those produced in the United States. So, the model of Edison is very significant in this genre. The kind of genius mm. inventor who often against the odds and in isolation comes up with some technology which has the capacity to truly transform the world is a common um, thread that runs through much of this. And you find this in this novel, obviously, with the uh, development of a particular form of air power. And in some others, it's a particular you know, naval vessel or a kind of sem- you know, proto laser beam or whatever it might be. So yeah, th- these kind of magic or um, fantastical technologies run through this. This is one of the things that, despite his anti-Americanism, or at least perceived anti-Americanism, makes this book, in many ways, more of an American one than a British one. The British ones tend to have a less um, hallowed role for um, Mm. individual technologies. It's the American ones, and it's not a coincidence because it's of the role of Edison in the cultural imagination uh, that tend to imagine a kind of magic bullet technology. So for him, it's air power here. And again, that's quite common. Wells picks it up himself and probably gives the most famous rendering of it. But there's this vision of of Pax Aeronautica, that if you can control the sky, you can really transform the nature of war because traditional models, whether the dreadnought or the great land armies, are rendered um, obsolete overnight. And you find that repeatedly in the battle scenes in this book where hundreds of thousands of um, enemy soldiers are massacred uh, time after again to, uh, by mm. air power, which is basically untouchable. So it is a fantasy of technological control, uh, something that later on in the century becomes closely aligned with uh, various fascist ideologies. So this has, a, again, a long kind of afterlife, this kind of writing. Um, but it is striking at the period. And it bears little relation, of course, in that sense to what then happens in the First World War. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. There's a lot of the bits and technology in the book. It's kind of like simultaneously, there is some, some like horror there, but it's also like marveling at the destructive power of it. So yeah, that's definitely in there. So um, yeah, thank you very much for coming on to talk to me about this book. Uh, as I am obviously a fierce defender of utopianism, but I think it's always important to pick out these kind of problematic tendencies that you can find to weed those out so i think it's good to yeah it's good that um you'd say this stuff uh, as i understand the, the stuff that your book's going to be talking about is kind of bringing to light some of these um forgotten things so um yeah that's right yeah, um, it's a book book called dream worlds of race uh, that i'm working on at the moment hopefully be done sometime next year <laughs> Yeah, so there you go. So if you've been interested in um, this conversation, then keep an eye on that. Um, So yeah, thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you. So that's the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. The next episode, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, will be on the simulacra. And then, I'm not sure, we'll see what's coming off of that. I'm working on stuff on The Dispossessed, Frederick Jameson's An American Utopia, and Cloud Atlas. So those will probably be the next in some form or another it might be another philip k dick novel in the middle of there somewhere but yeah i'll tell you about those as they go on um if you have any questions or comments or suggestions or anything that you want to talk to me about you can get in touch with me on utopian horizons pod at gmail.com and you can tweet me at utopian horizons as i mentioned uh itunes reviews would be good recommending the podcast to someone you could at least follow me on twitter that would be something um oh and yeah if you want to follow duncan on twitter he's at dr duncan bell so that's easy to remember um 
that is, I think, everything. So, yeah, thank you for listening. And I will be back soon with an episode on the simulacra.